Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Execute Scent Control, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scent Master, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. We're at the Iowa Deer Classic this week. We're going to bring you some of the sights and sounds and the highlights of the show. And then later on in the episode, I'm going to be out in the field again uh, talking about the terrain features that we started last week. Uh, secondary ridges, primary ridges, and how the deer relate to those terrain features. Hopefully you enjoy the show and we'll jump right to the action. This is Steve Finnegan. I'm the manager of the Iowa Deer Classic. We're out here today on Saturday, uh, one of the biggest days of the show. Uh, behind me is the uh, Iowa Hall of Fame. Every year we invite all of the uh, deer that meet the uh, requirements for the Boone and Crockett all-time record book. We give them an invite to come and put their deer heads on display. We get somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 deer that meet that criteria. Uh, makes for a tremendous display here. In addition, we got our big buck contest going on, so we're getting fresh entries coming in. We've had just a tremendous turnout this year with exceptional deer. We've got a lot of them. We've still got another day of competition coming in yet tomorrow. And so by the time the uh, weekend's over, I think we'll probably see may three, maybe 400 exceptional deer that are brought into the Iowa Deer Classic to be measured. All right, hi, today we're here looking at the new Nitrum Hoyt 30. Um, it's offered in three different models, the Nitrum 30, 34, and the new Nitrum Turbo. Um, what's unique about this bow is it's got a new riser design, patent pending for Hoyt, super, super stiff riser. And if you take a look at this riser, you can tell right here how wide it is. And what we've done, the engineers have stiffened this riser up about three times by making it wide up at the top. And then at the bottom, they've done a bridge pocket system like we've done on our target bows, which also stiffens that up, which basically translates into less vibration after the shot. Another great invention this year that we've got is the Zero Torque ZT Cable Guard System. Every bow when it's shot, no matter if you're right or left handed, has natural torque. A right handed shooter will have the torque coming like this, okay? What the engineers did is they looked at the different roller guard systems that are currently on the market, and the majority of our competitors have the roller guards at the back. Well, these cables want to come in, so there's natural torque wanting to come in. Well, when the rollers are at the back, they want to pull in. So the engineers looked at it and said, hey, can't we just flip-flop that and have the torque coming this way? So when the bow is drawn, our rollers come around this way, come around this way, so they will line up with you at full draw, they want to counteract the natural torque of the bow. Where normal roller guards add to the natural torque, the new Hoyt CT roller guard takes away from natural torque. Check out your new Nitrum Hoyt bow, the 30, the 34, the new Turbo 33 at your local authorized Hoyt dealer. Hey, I'm Jordan coming at you from the Iowa Deer Classic 2015 with Redneck Blinds. I uh, wanted to show you a couple of the new things we brought to the blind. Uh, first thing, this is a 6x6 six six Buck Palace. Added new carpet above the windows to damper sound and obtain more heat. And then this year, what's really great is to open the windows, you don't even need to get out of your chair. Uh, Redneck has installed a pulley system. You don't have to 
get out of your chair. So that's a great new addition to 2015. Uh, check out all our other products at www.redneckblinds.com. New for 2015 at QuietCat, we've made some definite improvements to our new models. Uh, one of the most substantial changes you notice if you're familiar with our product is we've gone to a, a four inch front tire and a four inch rear, rear tire with more aggressive tread. Makes the units definitely more stable when they're out uh, uh, in the woods and on the trail. We also added a larger rack on the back. Uh, this is an aluminum rack so it doesn't add a tremendous amount of weight. Also for 2015, we've got our Rancher model, which is our high high end unit. Basically, we've gone to a 72 volt lithium unit, so you're going to have more power. Uh, you have a 35 mile radius on one charge. So you can see there's a substantial difference in size of the front motor hub, and then also the battery is a full size 72 uh, volt lithium. So again, that's going to give you more more ground power. It will hold up to a 30, 310 pound uh, weight capacity. You can also still pull a game cart behind it. So it's basically just giving us that extra power that we needed uh, that our consumers were asking for. Hey guys, Gene Price here with Trophy Rock. It's getting closer and closer to turkey season when I know we're all gonna be out in the woods. And that's also a great time to refresh all your mineral sites and start looking for your inventory know of your bucks for this upcoming season so just remember it's getting real close to turkey season great time to get trophy rock out and start getting trail cameras on it to see what we have to hunt for this coming fall on this segment of the episode i'm going to be going down into a different part of the farm uh, looking for a stand location where we can hunt touchdown next year this is a buck that we encountered quite a few times uh, last year at the tail end of the rut and during the late season after we'd given up on hunting for Lucky on the other end of the farm. I think he's real killable. Uh, I know he made it through the through the hunting season, uh, assuming he made it through the winter. We've got trail camera pictures of him uh, in the late part of January and hopefully we can find his antlers. But one of the weaknesses that I've had, and I've talked about it a few times, is a lack of really good morning stands on this farm. Uh, I tend to be really conservative fringe type of a hunter and uh, the morning stands really need to be back in the uh, cover a little ways uh, so we're gonna find one uh, we're gonna we're gonna fly this first I've got my uh, uh, this is a, a DJI Phantom 2 for those people who are curious about the aerial system that we use first off let's look at it on the aerial photo and uh, this is the part of the farm that we're focused on the clear other end is where we spent most of last season hunting uh, today we're going to be walking just really a pretty small area right here. This is the big bottom field where we were picking up all the sightings of touchdown uh, back in late November and throughout December. And uh, we're sitting right here right now. And the roads are muddy enough and the fields are muddy enough that we can't drive back there so we're going to have to walk our way in. But the area I'm going to focus on is going to be right here. And the reason I like this area uh, is, is real similar to what we started talking about last week. It's got some cool secondary ridges. Uh, they can really pan out well for you during the rut because we know those are ideal bedding areas for does uh, and the bucks know that too. I want to talk real quick about these maps that I'm using. Uh, these are made by a company called Hunt Terra and we uh, met the owner and his wife at the Iowa Deer Classic last weekend and that was uh, a lot of fun. I really like what they're doing and they're great quality maps. Uh, so if you're looking for one you might want to check that out. One of the cool features on this map is uh, the gridding of the map itself. It's got little one acre squares. It's, it's a small superimposed gridding over the top of the entire map. So you can look at a field, and you can study it for a little while, and you can come up with almost exactly how many acres it is. And It's just a cool feature of this map. Uh, so let's head back in there, and uh, I'll stop along the way and, and do a couple flights with the Phantom, and I'll show you how that process works too. I like to fly this thing, start out in the open like this uh, to get it up into the air because if you run into trouble it's always going to try to come back home again and land. So if you're in around trees or in a little narrow spot uh, you can run into a lot of trouble when it comes back because it may not land exactly where it took off from. Then you've got your uh, investment you know, twirling its way down out of the tree branches of a, of a 60 foot tall oak tree. So we're right out on the edge of this open field. Uh, I'm going to launch it here. And we're going to fly the route that we walked in. Then we're going to fly a bunch of these draws and some of this uh, country out here in front of me. Uh, the trick with the, 
with the Phantom, um, I mean, you just have to understand all the settings. So make sure your settings are correct and go through your checklist and then you should be all right. Uh, so it's a little bit breezy for it today. It's not ideal. It's best when you fly when it's a little bit of low winds, but it's only 10 miles per hour, so it'll handle it pretty easily. I'm right at the top of the ridge now where this lane runs down to the bottom field. And I think uh, this is going to make a really good daytime uh, morning type hunting location for trying to kill that buck touchdown. In front of me, about 100 yards away or less, is one of the poor man plots that we made a few years ago. I remember I lost about five or six pounds putting that one in, so at some point I'm going to need to hunt it. Uh, so this might be the year for that. Uh, behind me, there's a really nice secondary ridge that runs off this big ridge to my right. So to the right of me is the, is the cornfield, uh, and then over to the left, or, or really straight behind me, is uh, where the uh, uh, secondary ridge is that I'm going to walk out on. And that's going to be, I believe, the best spot in this part of the farm. I'm on the end of the point right now, and this is where I think I need to be, although uh, getting in here would be the tricky part. Uh, the ideal wind would be a wind out of the north coming from the direction that I would be coming from. I don't like going into a spot with the wind at my back, so I might be stuck having to hunt this on a south wind, which means I'd have to jump up this ridge a little ways, but even though I'm not seeing any really concentrated sign here other than one big rub, I know that when the rut comes that they're going to be cruising through here. I'm just down about 15 yards below that tree that I was pointing at on the upper side. And there's a real nice uh, heavy trail going around the end of the point right here. And it goes past some big rubs. And uh, this is where the deer would be most likely to be uh, roaming during the rut. It'd be easy enough for him to, with the wind blowing this way, to kind of hang on this side of the ridge and scent check what's up on the ridge. You know, their noses are good enough they can pick that stuff up. And again, it, it, and I keep beating this horse, but uh, it's just really hard to get back in here and hunt this with the right winds. You're going to run into that a lot. Uh, I mean, that's where I need to be. You're just going to spook some deer. Uh, you know, I don't like that. This little series of trails back here on the back side of it. So then you just got to... You just gotta accept the fact that you're gonna screw some stuff up going in. Dang it. That's the stand that we hunted uh, back in December quite a bit. I guess it was December, no, it was November, towards the tail end of November, uh, right up ahead here, right on that trail that comes down. And that might be where we end up. I mean, there's no doubt the spot to be is right up on that ridge, but you've got too many trade-offs there. We might be better off just hunting the fringe again. Sometimes the best spot isn't the place to be. Sometimes you got to be just a shade out so you're not in there spooking everything. So this is the poor man plot that we did a couple years ago. You can see there's uh, not any clover in there anymore, but we can fix that. There's a spot here that Mike Sawyer used to hunt all the time, and he called it Old Faithful. And uh, I think that Old Faithful might be the payoff for us. Those trees make a lot of sense. You know, then you're hunting that south wind and possibly even an east wind. Uh, it would be nice to have something with a little north back in here, but so far I haven't found a, a good north wind spot. But that's, I like this. You can see some heavy trails here. Deer always kind of uh, orient themselves to openings anyway. Whether it's mornings or evenings, if there's an opening and the buck is cruising by, they tend to pop out on there and work a couple of scrapes and sniff around. And if there's food there, then it's even more attractive because they figure that the does are you know, in and out of there and they can uh, not only you know, do their normal thing, but they can also sniff around and see if any does have been through. So this would be a killer spot for that buck. Uh, so that's going to be it uh, for today. I've learned what I need to learn, which in this case, uh, what I learned is making my life easier instead of harder. Both of the spots that we've got already set up make the most sense for hunting this part of the farm. I'd love to be out on that secondary ridge. It's too risky. We're going to bump too many deer. So we're going to hunt that stand on the trail leading down from the top here into the bottom field. Easy to get to, we're on the fringe of the activity, we're not gonna spook very much. This one here is even easier. Uh, we're gonna spook even less here. And it's got a lot of history. 
it's got a good track record of producing some really good deer. So uh, that's uh, that's the plan. I'll come in here and clean these spots up a little bit, and uh, I should be rocking and rolling for some nice morning hunts this fall. Well, I appreciate you joining me. We are going to get some shed hunting in now. It's uh, almost 70 degrees today. Snow's all gone. The gang's coming down for the weekend, and uh, we're going to show you what we find here uh, on next week's episode. It was a lot of fun at the Deer Classic. Thanks uh, to everybody that stopped by the booth. We enjoyed visiting with people that we've seen there just about every year. If you haven't been to that show, you might really enjoy it. Uh, one thing that really struck me uh, was, was getting around and talking to the guys with the uh, Iowa Bowhunters Association, the IBA. And if you have an opportunity, that's a great organization to join. And really, in every state, uh, you're going to find organizations like this. But the beauty of the IBA is their lobbying system. Uh, they're the only lobby in the state of Iowa that represents the sportsmen. And they're reasonably powerful, but they need um, more voices and they need uh, more names and, and you know more power behind it. So uh, take, take a few minutes and check out the organizations in your state that represent you well. In the future, we're not going to be able to count on deer management in, in the traditional fashion. It's become a lot more political. So we need to be politically active. Uh, the IBA is politically active, so try to find something in your state if you can that would uh, do the same thing for you. Well, I appreciate you joining me this week. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.